Andrew, thank you very much. Um, Lord Levine, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it falls to me to uh, present, if you like, the, the business case in a few moments uh, on why there should be a response to what uh, Penn and uh, Nick have so well laid out for us. Uh, there, there can be no doubt that we are at a tipping point. We are at a point of discontinuity when all else will not be the same. Now, I say that not because we've learned for the first time that we are experiencing global warning, warming, but maybe for the first time we were beginning to believe it's inevitable in our lifetime, and perhaps even more important, we'll be held accountable for our response to it. So let me first say nine years ago, we had uh, 50 senior executives from financial services in a two and a half day meeting looking at sustainability. Uh, the outcome was twofold. One, it was uh, a rousing chorus of a song called Sustainability to the Tune of Crocodile Rock, which everybody joined him in gusto. But the other was, uh, somewhat more seriously, uh, that uh, tomorrow we would be judged uh, by those standards for our actions today. And I would argue that that today has arrived where our past decisions will come back and influence our competitive performances for our businesses. And equally, decisions we make today will be judged tomorrow uh, by the consequences of what tomorrow is like. I want to raise nine points very quickly on, and each of those points is either a risk to an organization, a threat, or it's an opportunity depending on where you stand. And at points of discontinuity, there are great opportunities. And I don't say that in any sense of callousness to the circumstances that the world finds itself in. I just say as an encouragement to business that all is not despair at times of discontinuity. There are opportunities to create sustainable differentiation in the way our businesses operate, which is particularly key, obviously, in saturated markets. And by way of example, Andrew mentioned the great crash. And I can tell you that in 1929, Motorola was formed, the first car radio, in the middle of the greatest depression the world had ever had. Uh, Revlon, uh, the beauty company, was formed in 1932. And finally, Kraft, one of the world's largest food companies, started with Miracle Whip in 1933. So at points of inflection, if we are prepared to see them as opportunities, we can act. And it is my belief that many of the things that we need to have done in the world, for the planet, for future generations, will be motivated, affected, implemented most effectively by business. So the first one is cost of doing business. Whatever way we look at it, however we add the numbers up, whether it's 5 or 20% of global GDP, we are looking at an enormous amount of money to fight global warming. That is going to be expensed through business, through taxation. And whichever way we look at it, maybe polluter pays. So already aligning ourselves with best practice in all of the issues that help offset global warming may save us the lion's share of that cost as we move forward. Secondly, consumer attitudes are changing rapidly. One of the indicators we saw during this, this uh, recession was that ethical spending stood up to decline against other forms of spending, other drivers of spend, simply because people felt if there was no great cost option, it was the better way to go. Secondly, supply chains are increasingly going to be impacted, not just by storms and flooding, access and availability to ports and roads, or the cost of fuel as we do reach peak oil, reaching five pounds a litre, as folk have often said, but also because we'll be competing on the global stage in networks of supply chains versus networks of supply chains. I would argue that those that align themselves to the needs of the planet, low energy, sustainable energy, shorter distribution cycles and channels, will find themselves at advantage in the future. Investor attitudes, my third point. Increasingly, as we understand the viability of business, will be linked to that business playing its part in combating global climate change. Investors will want to align themselves with those businesses that have a more reliable, less risky future based on their attitude policies towards climate change, those green policies that we've erstwhile seen coming out of our CSR operations, which are now, of course, centre stage to the very strategies of our business and the sustainability of our businesses. Lenders, 
The bankers have been in the media a while, but nonetheless, we need capital to run our businesses. Why would capital markets lend to businesses that are not viable in the long term if consumers, investors, governments and regulators turn against them? I would suggest that access to capital and the cost of capital will be greatly impacted by organizations' ability to demonstrate that they are part of a solution to global warming, not part of the problem. And that brings me around to the insurer's attitude. We're in the building, Lloyd's, center of the world's insurance, and certainly the underwriting business. Why would you want to underwrite a business that is causing part of the increased cost to your business, greater storms, greater floods, greater emergencies the world needs to face, and the cost of that? Why would you be insured? So the day you don't get underwritten for your employer's liability insurance, you're out of business and you need to sell your brand to one who is trusted greater. This is a short-term and immediate paradigm shift I believe we're going to see. Another item that was writ large before our world recession was access to talent. Talent is going to have a choice as our economies recover. Talent is going to decide which organisations to align themselves with and before we knew that this was key, was your ethical, sustainable, environmental stance was important to those folk when coming alongside your brand. If you're the polluter, then why would they want to come join you? If you're not part of the solution, why would they want to spend effort and energy with you? I believe a great differentiation in the labour market is going to be one's ability to show, again, a demonstrable track record demonstrable policies that provide them with a the joy and the pride to come alongside and work in your organization. Two last ones. Regulator. We can only expect that regulators will be encouraged to, to be more aggressive in the future and that there will be perhaps naming and shaming of those that aren't walking the talk but are greenwashing. We can only expect, in fact, admire and encourage regulators to be positive to those that have invested and are taking themselves down the carbon-free route, who are reducing their wastage, who are reducing their energy consumption, are caring about their supply chains, and are operating on a global, ethical, and sustainable basis. So stick and carrot will be there. And finally, government. Governments have been slow to respond to this issue, not least of all, as the Secretary General mentioned, why? would you want to address something that isn't in your time? But the time has come for business to decide if there is a sustainably differentiated opportunity to set yourself apart from your competitors on a global basis, not just meet the minimum requirement of what's required as the standards increase to preserve our, our planet, but exceed them on a regular basis. So in summing up, setting goals as a leader on environment, social, ethical management of your organization could lead to being more attractive to consumers, to suppliers, to lenders, to investors, to new talent and insurers, and can really to reduce cost and waste in operations and avoiding costly engagements with regulators. Let me encourage us not to look at this as a problem but a defining moment in our planet, a defining moment for business to recognize the business opportunity from climate change. Thank you.